Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody failed lab inspection day. When I was 12 years old, my class went on a field trip to a Civil War museum and shop. I saw round lead balls, musket balls, in a bin for sale, believe it or not. I bought around 20 of them, and when I got home, I thought it would be cool to melt them and pour them in some candy molds my mom had. I used a handmade clay pot full of dried rice and isopropyl alcohol as the heat source. I'm doing this in my bedroom on my desk. Meanwhile, my dad was watching the Super Bowl in the house he just finished building and was still way in debt. Suddenly, I hear a tink sound come from the clay pot and sure enough, it cracked, pouring the highly volatile alcohol onto my desk and onto my nylon backpack as well as the carpet. I run in horror away from the flames and yelled to my dad, FIRE! He came flying up the stairs in horror and tried putting out my backpack with his bare hands getting melted nylon third degree burns all over his hands. Luckily, my room was next to the bathroom where we got the water to put it out. Needless to say, I felt horrible and still do. His hands are fine, but I just don't know how I didn't realize I needed Pyrex glass. Thank God the house was not burned down. I was only 12, but still should have known this. This is a terrifying story. It's definitely lucky that their house didn't burn down. It probably goes without saying that this was dangerous, and I'm glad to hear that you weren't hurt, but it's unfortunate that your father had to suffer. When threatened, the lithium-ion battery can expand up to twice its usual size. So if your phone starts doing this, it's just because your lithium-ion battery is starting to feel threatened. If your lithium-ion battery stays expanded for more than 12 hours, make sure you contact a phone doctor. A fantastic story that still scares me to think about today. I worked for a university that was foregoing terrible monetary stress quite literally falling apart at the seams. During my time working in the labs there, helping to essentially put all the millions of dollars of equipment together, do private research, and other odd jobs, one of the lab supervisors had tasked me and a student of the university to aid in taking inventory of some of the old chemical samples they had from when the school used the labs we were working on. We both went down to this closet, which was completely unlabeled I might add, and opened the door. Immediately, the smell hit me. It was potent, vile, absolutely chemical and carcinogenic. The door, over the past 60 years, was tinted from chemical vapors. As we went through the labeled chemicals, as many weren't, I began to both become in a state of pure chemist galore and fear for my own life. The closet was a chemist's wet dream and an EPA agent's worst nightmare. There were many 10 liter bottles full to the brim of carbon tet, multi-gram levels of uranium salts, a kilogram or more per bottle of mercury salts, scheduled drugs, nitrobenzenes, kilograms of sodium, and so much more. The room was no more larger than a small walk-in closet, and it had a single light that emitted a faint sodium yellow glow. All wood floors, door, and ceiling. I sadly had to leave before the full inventory was done. The student and I had logged a few hundred chemicals, but from what I hear, there were thousands counting the unlabeled samples going back 60 years plus. Working there was like looking back in time. Nearly everything in the labs was antique, pure, and beautiful. I think even some of the glass was hand-blown. I must admit, seeing those chemicals was a highlight of my life, as I may never see them again. Not too many people have been able to view chemicals made forbidden for some 30 years now. It was a great pleasure I wish all chemists could enjoy. Maybe in a museum behind glass, however. A chemical museum is needed. I agree. I think it would be great if we had a chemical museum. That would be a really cool thing for everybody to see, where you get to see examples of all of the different chemicals we have made as the human race. Obligatory not a chemist, but my studies and work involve seaburn, dangers, and emergencies. So I am one of those people stupid enough to voluntarily go towards those situations. I'll do a short, safer work version. Do not attempt to make explosives at home. Never. During training, I saw the results, or rather leftovers, of someone who tried to make some nitroglycerin in their apartment. You'll never get the stains out of, well, everything. This channel takes the stance that you should only do chemistry when it is safe to do so. There are better and worse ways to practice chemistry, and people can unilaterally agree it is best to do chemistry when you're not doing it alone, when you have the appropriate PPE, and you have the appropriate safety measures in place for when things inevitably go wrong. If you're doing chemistry without any of those things, you are actively putting yourself in harm's way. And just because you've got away with it so far doesn't mean you're not taking a risk. You are. I made bromobenzyl cyanide as a building block to make one of my own chemicals and did not realize it was such a powerful lacrimatory agent. We briefly mentioned in the incapacitating agent tier list bromobenzyl cyanide. If you haven't checked out that video yet, I'll include a link to that in the description. 
After pipetting it into a vial in my fume hood, a drop or two came out of my pipette onto the floor next to me, and within seconds my colleague, who is in the fume hood across from mine, started complaining that his eyes were burning. Mine were too, really badly, and he was halfway through a column, which he had to pause so he could step out of the lab for an hour or two because it was so aggressive. Columns are the type of thing you don't really want to pause in the middle of because it can ruin your separation, but from time to time, if you interrupt a column, it can still be okay. It's just suboptimal. It's really scary to hear that you made this without knowing what it was. This happens quite often for new researchers who aren't familiar with risks associated with certain chemicals. During some of my undergrad research, I was planning to work with this chemical called acrolein. And if you haven't heard of acrolein before, it's this really horrendously offensive chemical which attacks your eyes and sinuses and is really toxic. It's a really great synthetic building block in terms of utility. As a Michael acceptor and an aldehyde, it's amazing but it's extremely toxic and it's a really dangerous chemical and it's easy to work with stuff like this without knowing the risks associated with it. I'm glad to hear that this story didn't end worse. Today's Yikes Awardee is Serena. People are always like, haha, why lick a rock? Forgetting about detecting different minerals slash sediment sizes. There's a certain point in the field season where licking a sliced rock to see if it's bitter is just so much more efficient than to wet it in water or blowing on it, water vapor in breath. I've licked hundreds of rocks at this point almost every rock I've ever met. How can you really see it without licking it? Not to mention the lovely hydrochloric acid left over. Thankfully, at least in these days, we have XRFs, which is X-ray fluorescence, to detect plagioclase versus potassium field spar, important components in most rocks, but rather difficult to identify, since they look the same in hand samples. An old professor had the tip of his thumb amputated because of an HF incident in the field. HF was used in the process to stain potassium field spar yellow, he took it upon himself to do all the staining of the rock so no one else would get hurt. Not sure entirely what happened, but he spilled HF on his hand and ended up ignoring it for a while, probably until he was urged to leave, then spending several hours traveling to the nearest hospital and then in the waiting room, since hardly anyone realizes how bad HF is. Horrific thinking about the pain, but that's how a lot of the old geologists are. I also worked with another dude who apparently broke both of his legs in the field once, but continued working for a couple days, hiking for hours because he didn't realize until later. This is just so awful in many different senses. You're probably thinking, hey, this story doesn't deserve to be a Yikes Awardee, but by the end, it's pretty clear why it's here. Geologists may feel comfortable licking rocks, but I think I'm gonna leave the rock licking to them. If you want a geologist to lick your rocks, make sure you leave a comment down below. This is today's big story. I inspected a lab a while back. This is how their fume hood was vented. You can see this fume hood here just has a vent. Normally this would be like an airtight seal that would go to a valve that ensures consistent airflow for the fume hood. But here they just have it venting directly into the lab and then they have an exhaust fan. Now I don't think that this is up to code. I guess Devov would have to tell us whether or not this violated code. But I think the fact that they're holding this up with literal packing tape is definitely concerning. Now Devov does have one other thing to say. Don't worry, I peeked in the window and took a new photo. They've improved the ventilation by snaking the clothes dryer duct into the canopy of an adjacent hood. Note, there is no blower on this hood. They're relying on the negative pressure at the end of the dryer duct to pull enough air through. I've emailed the owners. They don't think there's a problem. ISO 17025, accredited test lab by the way. Some of the US accreditation agencies are a joke. I especially like the smiley face drawn in the dust on the hood canopy and the region where some liquid has fallen down the exhaust ventilation and dripped down the front of the canopy. Here's what that picture looks like. You can see this is where a ton of liquid has run down. This is the smiley face in question. And here's their new setup where instead they have the ducting just going right underneath the top of this canopy. Definitely not a good practice. And hopefully they end up having to take responsibility for this because this is a really awful setup. I remember a story from my lab practices last year. We had to make some sulfonilamide, and one of the steps requires the use of chlorosulfonic acid. I think you know where this is going. There had been an incident with chlorosulfonic acid in the lab four years before this incident as well, so ever since then, the professors made sure everyone understood the dangers of it before the practical. However, due to COVID, the safety lesson had to be performed online, so quite a few people probably just muted it since it was rather boring. Then the day comes, and it goes pretty well, until the cleanup when one of the students picks up a clearly marked beaker of chlorosulfonic acid, about 50 milliliters of the acid left, and then just decided to pour it in the drain for whatever reason. Then some demonic screeching came from the pipes in the sink, and a geyser of sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid vapor spews out. Luckily, since at least some of the students listened to the safety lecture, we were all quickly evacuated and sealed the lab for the rest of the day to let the gases get extracted. 
Then, the lab safety instructor comes running down the hall, takes one look in the lab, and then just looks at us all with the most disappointed look I have ever seen. Luckily, no one was injured, other than a couple coughs and stuffy noses. Safe to say, we all had another two-hour lecture on the dangers of proper waste disposal. The student that caused the incident later failed her exams and had to quit. While there is definitely blame for the student here, I think the fact that undergrad students are working with chlorosulfonic acid is pretty crazy. That's a very harsh, very dangerous chemical, and I'm surprised that untrained hands are allowed to handle such high-risk chemicals. I'm glad to hear that no one was hurt, though. I was doing research on using osmium metal as a heterogeneous selective hydrogenation catalyst in a PAR reactor. After weeks of successfully carrying out reactions and characterizing the stereochemistry of the results, everything came to a dead stop. Nothing worked for two months. I got to the point where I wanted to toss some lithium aluminum hydride in the sink just to see a reaction happen. I replaced the catalyst, replaced the solvents, nothing. So I separated the osmium catalyst and weighed it carefully. Mm. It was 0.2 milligrams too heavy. Generated new catalyst, same results. Hmm, what the F? Turns out, one of my PI's other grad students had used the PAR reactor and split the stopper. He helpfully changed it out and replaced the expensive and failed silicone stopper with an in-stock black vulcanized rubber stopper. Sulfur from the stopper leached into the carefully purified solvent and poisoned my catalyst as it was being formed. I re-replaced the stopper and I was back in business. Only two months burned. Being a grad student is hard. I might also add that working with pyrophoric osmium powder is great fun. Hydrogen reduced osmium tetroxide. So if you're not aware of this, osmium is a really toxic metal and osmium tetroxide is one of those reagents that sometimes we still work with even though it's got some hazards associated with it. There are some other alternatives such as potassium osmate which can be used and they're a little bit more convenient to handle, but there is still inherent risk working with osmium. It's awful to hear that two months of your life were burned like that, but I am glad to hear that you sorted it out in the end. Your monkey poo story reminds me of the worst graduate student job ever described to me. My friend had to determine the handedness of the monkeys for some neurologic experiment. How do you determine that? Annoy the monkeys and determine which hand they use to throw poo at you. Ick. We use a few different acids in winemaking. And in my college wine lab, which is also part of a functional winery, there was a 5 liter bag in a box of, I think, 70% sulfuric acid. The first year students were in there doing some analysis and I decided to screw with them by dabbing my finger on the bottom of the spout and tasting it. Sulfuric acid is quite sour, it turns out. Freaked the first year students right out, lol. Usually, we would do that with a big bag of tartaric or citric acid to mess with them instead, which is probably safer. Another story. I was mouth pipetting 85% orthophosphoric acid to dilute it. Completely overshot the 50 mil mark on my pipette and got a big mouthful of the stuff. My teeth felt like sandpaper after that for a good week. Funny enough, orthophosphoric acid has a slight sweet taste that I can remember. Probably more sour than the sulfuric overall though. This is so dumb. Don't taste sulfuric acid. Don't taste concentrated phosphoric acid. I only included this story as an example of what not to do. This is awful, and you should not repeat this. Here on the channel, we are figurative mouth pipetters, and the only thing we mouth pipette is soda with a straw. Foof losing a fluorine is a big oof. I know I haven't been making these as frequently, I just released a video on the second channel talking about it. You're welcome to go watch that video if you'd like to learn more. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.